question here is that seeing as we're at a technology conference, you would think that these things would work themselves out. Um, but that's not only a good thing because I don't I don't actually run a technology company, maybe maybe that's why. I, I do run a startup, uh, but the startup works pretty much exclusively in the education space. We do have a website, um, but we have we have no product, we have no IP, nothing related to technology knowledge. Which is interesting and, and I think it'll make this talk interesting. Um, I just I also just finished a book for Penguin called Hacking Your Education, which is all about how to learn outside of school and the importance of, in today's world and economy, learning the sorts of skills that make you an entrepreneur. Um, my, my, my background in this is, is pretty unique. I left school when I was 12. I'll tell that story a, a, a little bit later. Um, but the, the book basically uses my story as a narrative basis. And I interviewed about 40 or so people who got to do interesting things with their lives without relying on formal education. Some became entrepreneurs, artists, doctors, lawyers, architects. The key thread is that what they do professionally has little to do with what they did in a classroom. Um, so my, my story starts uh, when I was 12. And I came to my parents and I told them that I didn't want to go to school. And as you might expect, my parents weren't exactly thrilled with this, right? Uh, they, they sort of laughed at me, because after all, who, who really wants to go to school when you're 12, right? When you're 12, you want to go play outside and like, play video games and hang, hang out with your friends. You don't want to spend time in a classroom. But my parents believed me enough to allow me to make my own decisions and said, hey, it's your life. If you want to make your own decisions, go ahead. The worst thing that could possibly happen is that you might go back. And at 12, you're not going to fall out of the rack. School's always going to be there. Um, so I, I left school and, and I became what's called, what's called an unschooler. It's a self-directed performed homeschooler. So throughout middle school and high school, instead of going to school, I found mentors and real businesses and did internships. I worked at startups and was able to do all these things that I never would have been able to do had I been in the classroom. And what that did was that not only did it prepare me with the specific subject level knowledge that anyone would have learned in a classroom, but I also learned a very specific meta-learning knowledge that made me a better and more effective learner. How to find mentors, how to build a community, how to evaluate myself, how to set my own goals. All those sorts of all the sorts of skills that help you become a better and more effective learner and worker, no matter what field you're actually pursuing. Um, one, one key distinction that I want to make here is that homeschooling is not the same thing as, as unschooling. Unschooling does not look much like school, and you don't spend much time at home. Uh, we were, I was not unschooling because I, I wanted to, to avoid learning biology or or sex ed or anything like that. This is not, not, not a conservative movement of, of the southern part of the states at all, um, but rather a movement to, to embrace the freedom to learn how, where, when, and why you want to. Unschooling came out of the 1960s, and it's, it's, not, it's, not, uh, it's not, a, not a new thing at all. Uh, it started with this guy named John Holt, uh, and there's some other books like Summer Hill about a school that started in the UK in the 1920s that sold about 3 million copies over the course of about seven years, which is just an astronomical number in, in terms of book sales. Probably the most seminal book was called uh, Deschooling Society. It's particularly interesting because it envisioned, it envisioned how computer networking could apply to education. Um, and what's interesting about that is that this book was written in 1971, uh, before computer networking existed. Uh, and even back then, people were thinking about how they could take the lessons learned from technology and apply them to the educational sector. Uh, what, what, the, what, what, what unschooling really gets to the core of is not whether or not should we go to school, is school valuable, should there be teachers, but what, whether or not we trust people's innate capacity to, to be curious. Do we think that if left alone, people will, left to their own devices, choose to goof off? choose to do what we deem unproductive activities, or will they choose to learn? Will they choose to do something engaging and productive? I, of course, think that, that people will choose to be, to be productive, to learn, to do things that, that help them grow as people. Um, and that's been, that's been my personal experience as an unschooler, and also with people that I interviewed for the book. Um, some of the things that I was able to do as an unschooler were fantastic. I, I worked on political campaigns, I organized collaborative learning groups, I helped build a library in my hometown. I went to crash startup conferences in Silicon Valley. I went to a startup uh, in Silicon Valley called Zinch, which kind of ironically actually helps people get into college. Um, I'll get back to that in a, in a second. Um, and it really came to the conclusion by the end of my time as an unschooler that, that unschooling was really quite superior uh, to public school. Um, 
it was, I, I, I went into thinking that, went into unschooling thinking that it was just an alternative, but finished unschooling thinking that I had a much better, more well-rounded experience than the experience of my peers. And then I started looking at, at the data, and looking at the data that the cross outcomes, the outcomes of homeschoolers and unschoolers far outranked those in the public school. And that was even despite, uh, despite the sorts of differences that would traditionally create a delta in public schoolers. Things like race, things like the amount of money that parents invest in education, things like the amount of education that your parents have. It was really interesting to see that, that, that those factors actually didn't affect the outcomes of homeschoolers and unschoolers. What's really interesting is that even after I spent six years outside the system, I still went to college. And it was a really interesting paradigm because I was basically trying to, trying to define my own measures of success, right? But it's really easy when the system is telling you that, that, that you're special, that you're doing well. You have colleges recruiting you because they say, hey, you're the type of student that we want. You're self-motivated, you're self-directed, you get along well with adults, you know how to interact with people. That feels really good, right? And they send you all these nice admissions guides and brochures and tell you that you're really special, and that feels good. And so I, I, I fell for it, I bought into it all, and I went to college, and that was probably one of the biggest mistakes that I made. Because college was not a place that valued learning. College was a place where people were there because they were told to be there. They were there because their counselors were there, or because their friends were there, because they bought into the same false hope that I had. Um, and I, dis despite being in, in a schooling environment, and despite doing very well, I got A's all my first semester of college, I came home from college that, that, that winter break feeling more alone than I ever had. Uh, and it was because, for the first time, I wasn't with a self-selected group of people. I wasn't with a group of people who had actively chosen to be there. I was with people who were there because they didn't know what else to do. So I was really from with college. Uh, I, was, I was complaining to my parents about what I was going to do with my life, uh, how I was going to, to make this better, uh, and, uh, and saw the applications for um, the Teal Fellowship, which I'm now part of, um, that, that, that came out I guess in, in fall of, that would be 2010, I guess. Um, wow, that seems like a long time. Um, and so started applying for that, and I wasn't really sure what I was going to do. I, I had this like wacky, crazy idea for an airline that people knew, who knew me years ago, will tell you about, and that's what I um, applied with. And, and, and got back to college and was really frustrated and really down and out, and um, you know, couldn't understand why people were so close minded it might have had a little bit to do with the fact that I'd gone to a college that was in Arkansas, uh, coming from California, um, but we'll leave that fact aside. Um, and so I, I got to college and, and I sort of, I, I made up my mind to leave whether or, I, whether or not I got the Teal Fellowship. And I was having lunch in the cafeteria with an acquaintance from English class. And he was asking me serious questions about my life after leaving. He was like, what are you going to do? How are you going to support yourself? How are you going to get a job? How are you going to learn the skills that are important in the real world? And then with complete sincerity asked, well, what, what about the beer and girls? Like, aren't you going to miss that? And to be fair, that is a completely valid reason to go to college, right? In fact, it's probably one of the more valid reasons. Um, the problem that I have with this is that there are a lot cheaper ways to find beer and girls than paying to go to college and spending five, three, or four, or six years of your life there, right? And just, and just as there are places to find beer and girls, like bars outside of college, there are ways to find the same sorts of knowledge that you would get in college, the mentors, the network, the education, the community, outside of the university as well. So once I was, once I was over being flabbergasted by this, uh, I finally came up with a good response, which was that, I prefer guys in Champagne, and there's a lot more of that in San Francisco than there was in Arkansas. Two years ago, I started on college.org, and it was really um, a lesson in figuring out how to think for myself. I think that the biggest difference that I observed from moving from college to the real world was that in college, and even as an unschooler, I had three to six months to, to prepare and study something before I was tested for it. In the real world, I had to figure out what I was going to do, and then actually do it the next step. So on college, on college started as, um, in college started as a blog about my frustrations with, with college, but in the, in the two years since it started, it's grown into so much more. 
It's now a global community of about 15,000 people who are all engaging in self-directed education. We run educational programs. We can run workshops called academic camps. Uh, this fall, we're starting a gap year program to take an entire cohort through the year-long process of not going to college. Um, and it's been, it's been a really great experience. Um, what's been interesting about being part of the TL Fellowship is that it's, it's served one piece of the part of, of, of what college will be unbundled into, and that is a signal. The school that I dropped out of, Hendricks College, is not well known. It's a school in Arkansas. Arkansas is not well known. Most people couldn't point to Arkansas on a map, uh, even in the States. The States is sort of like, there's California and there's New York, and the mass in between, like, maybe you can pick out Chicago, but that's, 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 that's wishful thinking. Um, so, so being part of the Teal Fellowship uh, was really interesting to, to help me observe how those different parts of college were being broken down. Because I was, I was finding that the community that I had in college back in San Francisco, I was able to, to, to get, get the knowledge that I needed through, through mentors and through online materials. Um, but having, having a name, the Teal Fellowship, that has some value within a certain com community was really, really essential. Um, and so that, that got me thinking more about more about how education is being unbundled um, and how that signal relates to the other pieces of education and what they might be. So school used to be this place where we where we go for everything, right? You go there and you find the teachers and you find the mentors and you find the content and you find the network and the community and all these things were just given to. But in, increasingly, there are ways to learn that are more efficient and more meaningful and less expensive than going to a school. And if, if you're going to do those things, you have to figure out how to learn outside of school. One piece is, is knowledge. It used to be that you have to go to a lecture hall and, and listen to someone, and now, now we, have, we have libraries and online courses. Uh, we have people in Africa teaching themselves how to, how to DJ with Open it used to be that you'd have to go there to find a community, and now people are, are building their own interest based communities, joining meetups, and finding ways to find people in other ways. Going to college can, can be a great way to, to, to join a network, to join fraternities and sororities, and find other alumni. But increasingly, there are ways to build that digitally as well. Twitter and LinkedIn are great for this. The reason that it matters to think about this as a young person is because it's really fucking scary to be a young person right now. Un youth unemployment is, is out of control. It's out of control in the States. It's more out of control here in Portugal. It's about 38.6%. Uh, the New York Times is running articles about Generation Limbo. The generation of college graduates who went to college, went to good, elite universities, went to Yale and ended up attending bars. Uh, and it's really scary to think that you might be investing four years in Fifty to two hundred thousand dollars, depending on the financial aid that you get, without gaining any appreciable outcome. Sure, you might have learned knowledge and had a good time, but was that really worth it if you're working a job that, didn't, that doesn't actually use the skills that you get? Um, there are almost six thousand janitors with PhDs in North America. Uh, the, the amount of learning that actually goes on in college is, is really abysmal. Thirty-six percent of students. Uh, on the clinical learning aspect, so it should know from critical thinking, complex reasoning, or writing. Uh, the average student is graduating with astronomical debt in the States. Um, the cost of college is going up astronomically, more than, more than any other consumer um, good, whether it's healthcare, or transportation, or medical care. Um, student loan debts are virtually in dollars in the States, all these things. But the problem is not just an American one. Uh, like I said, youth unemployment is a 38.6% here in Portugal, it's, it's true in, in, in many other countries around the EU. We're seeing increasing student protests, the UK triple tuition fees last year, and it's hard to imagine that other countries won't soon have to follow suit as, they, as, as, as the reality becomes that, that education is increasing uh, and someone has to pay for it, whether it's the government or whether it's you. So I think it's really important as a young person to figure out what those skills are. What those skills are that allow you to break down an education into different pieces and defend for yourself. Um, what, I, what I learned most in writing my book is that the most common uh, arguments that are made against self-education are false. 
Everyone says that in order to educate yourself, you have to be motivated, you have to be a genius, you have to be extremely privileged. Um, and in many cases, the people that I interviewed were the exact opposite of this. They weren't motivated. They were actually quite lazy. If they'd been motivated, they would have had the perseverance to actually stay in school and do the work and have the self-control to see the long-term gain. But instead they said, no, I'm going to take a step back. I don't understand this. I don't agree with this. I'm going to take things on for myself. Um, they, they, they're not the people who are starting the next Facebooks or the next Apples or the next Microsofts. The people who are norm doing normal, productive things, who are happy people who are contributing to society, but are certainly not geniuses. Uh, the people who are, who are geniuses are pulled up in research institutions doing research that, that both people will read one day. Uh, so it, I think that the, 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 biggest, uh, the biggest interesting, uh, the, the biggest learning experience from, from writing this book um, was, was discovering this whole network of people out there who had in effect become an anti-alumni network. Uh, who were bound together by the virtue of being self-directed, who would gotten to their place in life through meritocracy, not through degrees. And it was really valuable to see that there are people out there who can become doctors and lawyers and entrepreneurs and architects and artists and vice presidents of oil companies and business leaders and all these people doing very traditional quote-unquote things, but had gotten there through very traditional, or through, through very non-traditional things. Basically, I was, I was proven wrong. I, wrote, I went into writing this book thinking that everyone who was going to self-educate had, had to be motivated, had to be smart, had to have a predisposition, predisposition to this. And I, found, I, and I found through interviewing people and doing research and recording their stories and then eliciting exercises from those stories that anyone can, can find mentors and build a network, nurture a, a, a community of people, start a project, build their personal learning plans, keep themselves motivated outside of, outside of school, build a portfolio and figure out how they can prove themselves without relying on a degree. The old way of thinking used to be very linear, right? You'd go, to, you'd go to elementary school and then middle school and then high school and then eventually you'd get a degree and then get a job and then maybe you'd get married and get a house with a nice, nice white picket fence and get a, a, job, a car and a promotion and then a nicer car. And it was this very linear thing. Uh, and really thinking about education is much more than thinking about education, it's really thinking about success. Thinking about, is success to me these material things that are external that someone else decides that they are? Or is success something that I've defined myself? So much of the time we go through life trying to achieve a list that we have with. Uh, and I hope that as education becomes more decentralized and give people more power to, to learn for themselves, we can get to a place where people have more power to write their own lists. It's not difficult to imagine that if a young engineer wanted to, to learn to code today, that instead of just going to high school and then college and getting a job, she might take some courses online, build a community uh, through, through LinkedIn and Twitter and Facebook, maybe join, maybe join a fellowship program to gain some validation, build a portfolio or get help in Stack Overflow, and then use what she's done, use her real world accomplishments to show that she um, the, the, this world that I'm describing of self-education is not one that's, that's far-flung and hypothetical. It's something that's happening right now. The cost of college is rapidly increasing. Uh, the actual learning that's going on is, is, is decreasing. The value of each degree is decreasing as we kind of more and more of them. And I think it's more important than ever, especially facing massive youth unemployment and intense competition for jobs, that young people today understand how to learn the skills uh, you can find out more about uncollege.org, the group that I run at Uncollege. The book is available on Amazon. Uh, it's not translated into Portuguese yet. If anyone knows, knows publishers here and, and, and wants, to, wants to help that along, let me know. Uh, and I'd be happy to take some questions and I'll be around for the rest of the day. How easy do you think it is, it is for a student here in, say, high school, maybe a little bit above, to follow your model of 
of learning instead of just going through high school and college then trying to find a job? Unschooling and self-directed learning it, it is definitely hard, and at the moment it's still harder than going to school. Um, the reality of that is that it also makes it more impressive. If you're able to achieve the same outcomes as someone who went through school by doing something that was harder, that is more impressive than just following the system. I mean, I, I, it, it would be as ridiculous to say that everyone should be unschooled as it is to say that everyone should go to school. Uh, but I do believe that we should live in a world where people are free to make their own choices about how to educate themselves without, without being judged. Uh, and, and right now, that's, that's not true. Couple in the middle here. Uh, so you are kind of proposing it to be like, I am in high school, I left uh, the regular school and I go like, um, follow your education system. I, I, is it? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm proposing that you take a good hard look about how you're spending your time and how you're spending your money to make sure that you're going to get the outcome that you want. That, that, that might mean leaving school, it might, mean, it might mean going off totally on your own, but at the very least, I think it requires understanding that the skills and abilities and talents that will get you a job are the, skills and, are the same <coughs> skills and abilities and talents that will get you into college, not the things that you will learn in college. And it's, it's, it's up to you to figure out how to find networks and how to build a network and how to keep yourself motivated and how to start your own projects. Those are things that, that, that you have to learn for yourself that a college is not going to do. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. And because I, I think that college doesn't adapt to ourselves and doesn't respect our difference. But the point is probably the people who will uh, give us jobs won't take us seriously if we don't have like um, a degree or something properly. You're, you're in the perfect place to find a job without a, a degree, right? Startups are famously known for hiring people based on their merits, based on what they've done, instead of based on credentials. It's certainly still true that it's going to be much harder to get a job in a traditional sense without a degree, but I think that's, that, that's rapidly changing as employers are realizing that, that they're getting a thousand applications for a job and everyone has a college degree. And that, de that degree doesn't actually tell them very much about each person's skills and abilities and talents, whether or not they can get along in organization. I think one of the, we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of innovation uh, with, with GitHub and Stack Overflow, for example, in figuring out how we can change the hiring process to reflect people's actual talents. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I didn't really understand, so I'm just going to ask. Have you ever thought that maybe if you had actually gone to public school, college could be could have been better and even useful? If I had gone to public school longer, I would have been more conditioned to the system. Uh, I would have been more used to having people tell me what to do and how to learn in a certain way. Um, I probably, it would probably be a fair statement to say that I would have enjoyed college more had I gone to high school. Um, but that sounds like putting a band-aid on, on a, a, a much bigger problem, right? The, the, reason that I, the reason that I'm working on changing the attitudes and perceptions around going to college, first, before working on high school or primary education, is because if we do everything in education with our sights solely on getting into the next thing, going from preschool to elementary school to middle school to high school to college, we're missing the point, right? Education should be something holistic that's lifelong and life-wide, uh, that, that, that should be in a, a, an end unto itself, not, not a means to get into the next thing. And then there's one on the right over here. Yeah, go ahead. I agree perfectly with you. <laughs> I always say very similar things but it's more important experience than school. And now, uh, one question I have is, uh, well, I always say uh, experience is a problem. Experience is, uh, we need experience for jobs, and we need jobs for experience. And well, most of experience we can get, even with, for instance, unpaid internships. It's everything students, students, you need to be students, you need to be students. 
how do we resolve that, that problem, for instance, if we, if we take that kind of approach to schooling? How to come to an institution and say, I'm not a student, but I want to get that experience? Increasingly, we're seeing, um, well, two things. We're, we're, we're increasingly seeing institutions that are starting to award credit for non traditional experiences, either online courses or offline courses. There are a whole host of institutions that are now giving out credit for courses that, are, that you take through MIT or Courseware or Udacity or, or, or Coursera. Um, and the other thing is that there are a lot of opportunities that you can have to learn that don't necessarily have to be connected to institutions. Uh, if you you know, given, they're, they're, they're not going to be paid internships, uh, but they're also not, not going to be charging you like a college does. Uh, but but most, most businesses, most startups, if you say, hey, I'm really interested in learning this, can I volunteer one day a week to figure out how this works? They aren't going to turn down free labor. People, people need help, their, their hiring budgets are, are always short, and that, that is a, a living experience. Given, given it's not paid, but you also aren't having to pay a startup to work with. Thank you very much for having me guys.